Well, having lived in Ann Arbor for a few years and focusing on leadership my whole life, I am really pleased to introduce Richard Sheridan to you today. Richard is the CEO of Menlo Innovations, which is a award-winning storied software development organization that has won so many awards. And he's the author of uh, a new book called Chief Joy Officer. And after reading this book, I've ordered his former book, which is on its way to, to me. But it's, he's all about human-centered uh, values, how to achieve success, leadership, all the topics that we talk about all of the time. And this latest book really got my attention and it drew me right in on Chief Joy Officer. It's focused on leadership. So uh, welcome, Rich. Thanks for joining us today. Great to be with you, Skip. Well, um, I wanted to start off, there's so many places where we could start in this book because it is uh, literally almost any, you could open up the book and that's a topic I'd love to dive in and, and have. But I wanna start off with leadership and, and really self-understanding. Why is self-understanding so important to leadership? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges we have as leaders is um, connecting with our teams. I literally just got off the phone an hour ago with a CEO who's joining a firm on the first day and he was asking me about how do I connect? You know, he, he's done this before, but he wants to he wants to start off well. And in my mind, we have to build trust and trust can only be built over time. We can't as leaders just say, hey, I want you guys all to trust me. I want you to know I trust you. That's not how humans work. We can uh, say it, it just won't do anything, right? It might even have the exact opposite effect of what we were hoping. And I think one of our most finely tuned sense of smells is authenticity. I think the ability to sense authenticity in another human being may be one of our most uh, important uh, elements of uh, how we survived as a species. And so uh, building trust means spending time together, building relationships with other people. And I think ultimately we don't get to do that until we understand ourselves. And I think there's so many times where maybe even, you know, I think back to my earlier managerial career where I was almost taught, oh no, don't bring the real you to work. Bring the person that, you know, we want you to be to work. And I, I think, you know, if we live a lie in our, most of our waking hours, uh, self-medication is probably about the only alternative we have. <laughs> And um, so this idea of, of, um, of understanding who we are and understanding what, how to use the best part of ourselves to lead the people who really want to follow, who really want to be led, uh, I think that's one of the most important things we can work on as leaders. I love that. I love the, the tie into authenticity and showing up and understanding you and then being authentic because people can feel it if you're not and if you have a mask on, it's, it's readily apparent. And, and you go through these qualities of, of a good leader in, in a very unique way and then you dive in. And, and one of them that struck me for many reasons, but the way you, you did it uh, struck me was this reference to leadership and 1 Corinthians 13, this beautiful chapter on love, and it, you substituted the word leadership. And I found that to be so unique. Love is not something typically associated with leadership. And so I was quite interested in, in how and why you, you did that. Uh, so talk about love in the concept of, of love and leadership and in business. I mean, competitive business, love. How does that work? Yeah, I, I don't think we get to lead unless we lead with our hearts. And, uh, you know, that's where love centers inside of us. And, uh, you know, I, I think love and joy, uh, two words that occurred on the cover of my first book, are, are pretty vulnerable words to put on a business book. And I didn't know whether the world would take me seriously. And, and even the connection between that passage in 1 Corinthians and leadership uh, all of those times I've done that have felt just a little bit vulnerable for me as an author to bring that kind of message to the world. But the response that has come out of that, it confirms for me that this may be one of the most important things we should be working on as a leader. And it goes back again to that idea of 
bringing our whole selves to work. Uh, it's it's what our it's what our teams expect from us. <clears throat> it's what the people who surround us uh, want to believe in um, what what we're doing, why we exist, what our purpose is. And I think it just kept for me just kept coming back to love. And you know, and I had a great upbringing. I was I was brought up in a very loving family. And I realize most people, maybe I don't know, most people. That's probably the wrong word for it. But um, you know, a lot of people don't have that in their lives, and I did. And, and I realized that was a great blessing for me. And uh, it probably formed, in many ways, uh, my qualities as a leader. But regardless of where we, uh, where, what we experienced when we were younger, even in our earlier managerial careers. All of us face a choice. All of us face a choice of what kind of leader do I want to be? And, um, uh, you know, I have probably my favorite parts of the book, too. And I always say in every leadership moment, especially the important ones where you got to deliver a message, maybe a hard one, you can choose kindness or you can choose harshness. Uh, either one is free. One comes at a high cost. So true. You can be right or kind. Always better to be kind. And I, I think. I'm reminded of that, that saying I used to hear Zig Ziglar say all the time, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that feeling and that love really just, just changes things. I think people are, are much more receptive if you show up authentically and you really, um, you really care about them. I think that uh, matters uh, quite a bit. Another part of leadership that you talk about is optimism. And you say that optimism is a choice that every uh, person, every leader can make. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, it, it, it seems easier for some to choose optimism than others. For some, it seems like it's a huge leap, um, if you know uh, what I mean. Uh, the person that you label as the Eeyore type of leader who it may be good technically, but is struggling to be positive. How can you learn to be more of an optimistic leader, or can you learn to be more of an optimistic leader? Well, I think any time uh, in our lives where we can make a choice, we can learn to make that choice over and over again. I don't think that, uh, uh, you know, it, it's in our wiring or our DNA to be one way or another. Uh, I think it's more in our habits. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll relate it to my personal uh, fitness life. I, uh, I decided at 50 I was going to be in better shape at 60 than I was at 50, and for five years I proved that simply saying I wanted to be in better shape did absolutely nothing. <laughs> didn't it work? Was, yeah, it didn't work. It, it, it actually went the opposite direction. The visualization without going to the gym didn't work for right. you? Yeah, and you know, and thinking about eating better and thinking about running and all that kind of stuff just didn't seem to do it. Uh, and yet when I finally made the choice and signed up with a personal fitness instructor and started getting up at 630 in the morning to, to work out for an hour and now doing it three times a week and I just did it this morning and I feel great and it, it was, you know, I'd love to push the snooze button and, and stay in bed and I'd love to avoid the sweating and the muscle pain and all that sort of thing. But ultimately I made a choice and it wasn't necessarily an easy choice and that's a, that's the thing I talk about with optimism is a lot of people think being optimistic is easy, you know, that that is the easier choice. And I, and actually it's the harder choice. That's the thing I think that surprises a lot of people about optimism, because look, if, if we're spending our whole lives saying, oh, you know, uh, it's not going to go well, uh, we're probably not going to succeed. We're probably, heck, we can both predict failure and then chase our way right to it every single time. And uh, but choosing optimism says I'm putting myself out on the line here. I, I, I think things are going to go well uh, and I can have a lot of negative voices in my own head. And I can have a lot of people who love to perch on my shoulder, whispering in my ears and saying, no, it's not going to go well. Richard, what about all these things? And now as leaders, we have to say, well, what are we going to do about that? What actions can we take? Casting that to one side and then pushing forward and, and thinking in a, in a more positive way. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a choice and it is not always easy. And I think on some days harder than others, maybe on that rainy, dark morning as it is here today, uh, harder, harder to get out and go for a run or to the gym. You know, and let's face it, you know, everybody wants to believe a business life is one where it's like this 
beautiful upward sloping curve that they draw in MBA classes or something like that. And businesses are never like that. There's always uh, some existential crisis coming our way. There's always some thing that happens that we wish didn't. And now the question is, where do we reach in? How, how do we pull ourselves up? And, and I think optimism is a, is a really important element. And if it doesn't work out, because a lot of times it doesn't work out exactly as we choose, now the question is, what other systems have you put in place to catch you when you stumble, to catch you when you fall? And for us, it's our culture, it's our practices, it's our processes, it's our teamwork. So even if the things I'm imagining are going to happen don't turn out, I want to be sure that I put all the other systems in place so that if optimism doesn't go exactly the way we expect, we've still got a plan B. This is an unbridled, uh, irrational optimism. Right. It's, it's still grounded in reality. It's just a more positive reality. Well, I want to turn to something else you talk about in the book, which is that leaders create other leaders. You're talking about replication. And I, I found that to be very important, that leadership isn't just about getting something done, but about helping other people aspire and become leaders in their own right, which I think, in fact, um, we often mistake. You know, we think the leader is the one who gets it done, who, you know, you have to have there every time, when in fact the leader oftentimes can leave, and if the leader's successful and goes off on a trip, then you know, uh, other leaders step up, and that's, that's true leadership. So I was very struck by your comments on teaching, and, and how important is that to you over your career, to, to teach and replicate yourself or others uh, across your business? You know, I, I had a, a clanging symbol moment in my brain uh, when I first became a vice president, which is one of those moments where, you know, it's like, I did it, you know, I got there, I'm up on top of the perch. And I took my eight-year-old in to work with me uh, for a take your daughter to work day. And she watched her VP dad work the whole day, which in my head was like, I couldn't imagine a more boring thing for a kid to do than watch a VP work all day. What was she going to see me answering emails and phone calls and, and taking meetings and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, I asked her, I said, Sarah, what did you think? And she said, oh, dad, she says, it's clear to me you're very important here. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, well, it's clear nobody here can make a decision without asking you first. And she was very proud. And I was instantly mortified because I realized, oh, wait a minute, that's how I got here. I got here by being the smartest guy in the room, maybe overriding people at times, maybe gently, but still making sure everybody knew I was in charge. And of course, when you do that as a leader, you've essentially set the pace for your team. It can't move faster than you. And I didn't want to sign up for that. I didn't want the uncapped uh, personal commitment of you know being a VP of back then a troubled public company. And, uh, and I thought, oh crap, I'm not going to see my kids grow up. Uh, I'm not going to be able to have a life outside of work. And quite frankly, the other loss was I diminished the people around me. I don't want that. So I had to, I had to adjust my personal leadership style to encourage that personal growth, that professional growth in others, and realizing that now becoming a teacher is probably one of the most important things I can do as a leader. Well, there's so much in that. I think that I need to make the next interview with your eight-year-old daughter, who's now probably not eight, but she's yeah. quite insightful and may have been. Uh, she's, she's one of the smartest people I know, for sure. <laughs> Very keen ob observer of human behavior. I think that is uh, quite interesting. Well, y you talk a lot about culture. I know your first book also is a lot about culture. I haven't uh, re received it yet to read it, but um, talk a little bit about how a leader creates an intentional culture. And I like the way you say that intentional culture. Well, every organization, as we know, has a culture. Uh, in, uh, I think the vast majority have what, are called, what I call the default culture. You know, who did we hire? What behaviors do we tolerate? What attitudes do people bring to work today? And in, uh, default cultures can work for a long time until one day they don't. Nobody knows why they stopped working and therefore you don't know how to get it back on track. But an intentional culture is built around, a, I think, a number of key principles. I'll just pick out a couple of them. Uh, one is purpose. 
why are we here? You know, what as Simon Sinek says, uh, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about purpose to anybody uh, inside our team or the outside visitors who come and see us every year, I talk about two fundamental questions that every organization should ask. Who do you serve and what would delight look like for them? And for me, this goes back to what I learned by reading books by the Arbinger Institute on leadership and self-deception and the anatomy of peace. This idea of an outward mindset. And if we, you know, as leaders, we need to think outwardly. We need to, we need to point our hearts to the people we lead because we should be serving them. But as an organization, if we start turning our hearts uh, and attention out to the world, uh, this is what I believe drives people to gather in teams and form organizations is around this very uh, uh, motivating purpose of servant leadership, serving others with the work of our hearts, our hands, and our minds. And then the way to instill it and then you know, culture isn't a bunch of posters on the wall. You know, uh, that might help, but uh, it often doesn't drive cultural thinking. For me, it's about storytelling. Uh, there is so much here at Menlo that's wound around storytelling. Uh, when we give tours to people who come and visit, when we onboard new people, everybody here at Menlo is a storyteller. My actual playful title, but it's on my business card, is Chief Storyteller. storyteller. I like and, that. Um, and so, uh, Storytelling is, I think, a, uh, an element as old as human history, right? Uh, totems and campfire songs and anthems. And, you know, we formed tribes and communities and nations around great stories. And I think we need to, as leaders, remember the power of storytelling to move the hearts and the minds of the people who work around us. So very important. I've seen the power of storytelling over and over. I've also seen the power of learning, learning organizations individuals who are focused on learning and personal development, which is a passion of mine, and developing a culture of learning. And so as I was reading and you were talking about learning and this learning culture, I thought about how important that is. And uh, being the CEO of a company in Columbus, Ohio State, the Ohio State University, having run a company also in Ann Arbor where you are, University of Michigan, I don't know how that happened. Um, I'm in conflict inside my mind. Uh, but um, I'm wondering, and I've lived in lots of other places around the United States, do you think it's easier to create a learning culture in a university town? That's a good question. I haven't thought about it like that. Uh, I think it is imperative these days. Uh, you know, if, if we're not, as an organization, learning, we're falling behind. I mean, every, every company is facing an existential threat. Uh, you know, it's, it couldn't be more present than in the space behind me here. Right behind me used to be, that room that you're looking at, used to be the world headquarters for Borders Books. And they had 17 years to learn how to I've go. been in there when it was Borders Books, so I do yeah. know that. So there, there used to be a, a time where that was one of the most powerful bookstores in the planet. And you and I are both authors and readers, so we probably spent a lot of time in our favorite Borders bookstore in, in whatever town. The number one store is just across the street from where we were uh, or from where we are now. And um, uh, so clearly we need to stay in learning mode to keep up. And as leaders, um, you know, I, I say leaders are readers. Uh, you know, that might be self-serving as an author to say that, but I don't know any leader that isn't always learning from others. And a lot of the learning happens through books, whether audio or or, or actually reading the paper copy. And so uh, this is fundamental. And it may be that it's easier to be in that mode because you're surrounded by institutions that that's their very purpose. Although I, I, um, I always uh, joke with the education community that I want to reintroduce a, a new innovation in education, uh, and it's called learning. Uh, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of education is about teaching, and I think learning is a is, uh, far more important element. It is far more important. Yeah, I just asked that about university towns because I remember moving to Ann Arbor, and the first server we had told me that uh, she was getting a PhD in something that even after she explained it three times, I, I needed a degree to understand what she 
was getting yep. a degree in, but our conversation was, was fascinating. So um, I want to thank you for, for talking to, to us and, and for your book, which we just covered a few of the, the subjects uh, that it goes through. But Chief Joy Officer, it's an outstanding book uh, from a uh, fellow uh, leadership student and guru who uh, is, is interested in sharing these ideas with, with all of us. And I, I think it is a spectacular read. And um, so I, I highly recommend it. And uh, I'll just close with this. We are also both fans of all things Zingerman. So um, I've interviewed Ari before as well on this. Um, He's panel. been such a great mentor to me. And it's an incredible business, incredible yes. food. So um, I will say openly to you, I look forward to my next visit to Ann Arbor where I will invite you and maybe we can go uh, have a sandwich at our favorite place at Zinger. I love, so. I love it. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope many people get this book and live out its principles. It is an extraordinary journey of leadership in so many ways. So well done, thank you. Thank you, Skip.